Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, this is the first uh, event of this type that we've done, at least uh, in, in my memory of D41. So uh, we're thankful for everyone who came out. Um, thankful for everyone watching online. Uh, hopefully we all will get some great information. We're very excited to be able to, uh, to put this on. I want to thank uh, the district um, for their help in organizing this event. Um, it's put on by the PTA Council. For those that don't know me, my name is Kate Marsh. I'm president of the PTA Council, um, but certainly we couldn't have done it without our partners at the district, so we appreciate their help. Um, also to my co-chairs on the planning committee, Carrie Mario and Hema Denke. Thank you guys. Uh, it's been great working together. Um, for just a, a quick uh, bio, uh, Dr. Larson was born and raised in Glen Allen. She has firsthand experience in both D41 and D87 school districts uh, as, and, and community as a student, professional, and parent of two children. Dr. Larson is a doctor of clinical psychology and certified in neuropsychology and health psychology. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Larson. Thank you. Thank you. Never had a formal introduction before, so that's kind of nice. Um, so yeah, like she said, I, I went to Hadley. Um, I learned in these very walls and Lincoln and Glenbard West, so it's really, um, it's really special for me to be able to give back to the community that fostered my growth and development. So let's put that out there. Um, so tonight we're gonna be talking about stress because in the last few years, we've all kind of experienced a heck of a lot of stress and our kids are feeling it too. So we are going to hopefully change some distress into ways to de-stress. All right. So if anybody at home has questions, you can click on this link, type your questions in, and then I will be able to get to um, your answers. And if anybody live has a question, like, I don't know, raise your hand, speak up, um, indicate in some way, and I would love to address your questions as we're going, okay? So our objectives for tonight, there, there are several. Um, we first are going to talk about how do we recognize signs of stress in our kids? What are the effects of stress on our children? What are common stressors for kids? Because they're a little bit different now than they were even like four years ago. We have, we have a couple more things to worry about these days. How can we help our kids when they're feeling stressed out? And we're actually gonna talk about three specific coping skills that I'll be teaching you guys tonight that you can take home and use with your kids and yourselves. They work for grownups too. Um, we'll talk about how to identify when we are not enough as parents to help our kids. When things are just a little too much and we're worried about the kids, how do we know when we've hit that point? And then where do we go? Who do we talk to? What sort of resources are available? Um, and then finally, we'll talk about, like, what is therapy, right? We, we, we throw around the word therapy all the time. What does that mean, especially for children? Um, and then where to find local resources. So, um, okay. So you know your kids best. If you see your child changing in their behavior, that's usually a pretty good indication that something is going on. So you want to you want to be aware if, if your kid starts acting out for no reason or if they start becoming withdrawn and sullen, like those are pretty good indications, right, that there's something going on and we need to kind of dig a little bit deeper. Um, start looking at patterns, right? When do these new behaviors happen? Can you identify any triggers? Like, is it right when they get up in the morning? Is it Sunday night? Is it um, before soccer practice, right? So, so look for those patterns so, it can so they can help you kind of figure out like what's going on and why. Um, and then also think about what, what are those things that you find your kids um, when, when they start to feel better, what are those things that are helping them recover, right? Do they come home from school and they're freaking out and stressed and then they go and they chill out for a little bit and then they're fine? Do they just need that like downtime to feel better? Are they on the phone talking with a friend and then they start to feel better? So those are really important um, patterns to look for too, right? What, what helps them? So we have, um, 
we're going to talk about the effects stress has on our children. This is also what the effects are on us also. Um, but when we're watching for those behavioral changes in our kids, there are acting out behaviors, like we talked about acting out and being withdrawn, kids becoming oppositional, kind of out of nowhere, argumentative, or being dysregulated. Now, we talk a lot in the field about dysregulation, but we don't often define, like, what does that mean? So dysregulation can take on a lot of faces. When your child is being, um, when the, the, the term freaking out, right, or tantrum, or um, they're, they're just acting in ways that they don't typically act, their bodies might get elevated, um, their emotions get big. These are all ways that we see our kids dysregulating. So, um, you know, big emotions. Functional impacts of stress can be like their grades are dropping, right? They don't want to go to Girl Scouts anymore. They're, they've lost interest in activities that they used to find um, fun, right? Or you start to see social problems, like I don't want to hang out with my friends anymore, or I don't like this kid anymore. Um, those things that are affecting how they function in their day-to-day -day lives, these are the places that we're going to be um, looking. So I have a bunch of slides on things that are common stressors. I don't want to take too much time on this because I think what's more important is like how do we deal with the stress, right? How do we help our kids? Um, so I'm just going to kind of go through these briefly. Um, can you go back one? Sorry. Um, our kids are developing faster these days, and that has a direct impact on their ability to regulate in any situation. So whereas kindergartners never historically had homework, now most kindergartners are getting about 25 minutes of homework a day. That is not aligned with their development. That's too much for a child to do who's been at school for three to seven hours, depending on your kindergarten day. That's too much to ask of them after that, OK? Um, Kindergarten in um, literacy instruction has increased by 25% just since 1998. So we're expecting so much more of our littles. Art, music, and PE have dropped considerably in the early grades. Um, and second and third graders right now have three times the amount of homework that they did in the mid-90s. Three times as much, right? Academic pressures. Obviously, this can be very stressful for children, and it also leads to problems with sleep, increased anxiety, tearfulness, and not wanting to go to school, right? Our kids' job is to learn. It's to go to school, learn about themselves, learn about the world, and, and become functional adults, right? If they don't want to do that, that's really saying something, right? We, this, school should be a place of, of joy and learning. We want them to want to go. We also have a tendency to overschedule our kids. When we put our children in activities, the whole point is for them to like have fun, right? We, we want them to learn things and socialize and, and have a good time. But if we're overscheduling our kids too much, then that's going to lead to more stress. Um, our kids also have fewer outlets for stress these days. Um, I'm not going to read all the statistics, but kids are having less of the fun classes, less PE, less recess, less art music. Um, those things are stress relievers, right? If we run around midday, that's going to relieve some stress that might have been built up during a rough math lesson, right? So um, if you would, please. Chronic illnesses. Chronic illnesses have been on the rise um, since the industrial age. Um, that leads to stress. Media saturation, it's, it's constant. There is a constant stream of information. Our kids are not only being bombarded by data constantly, but a lot of it is inappropriate, right? And no matter how much we try to stay ahead and to filter and to monitor, they're going to see things that they shouldn't, that they're not ready to be exposed to. 
bullying and teasing, whether in vivo or through social media, bullying is really stressful, right? All of these things combined together, go ahead, Jim, please, um, just increase stress. Sleep deficits. I'm a huge proponent of sleep. I'd rather see my children sleeping than getting their homework done. Yes, I said that. Um, a third of parents say that the schoolwork and activities interfere with sleep, right? Our kids are chronically sleep deprived. Think about when you guys are sleep deprived. How's our mood, right? We, how's our concentration, our ability to focus or to problem solve, right? It sucks. We're doing this to our kids all the time, right? By not letting our kids get enough sleep, we're, we're causing cognitive and emotional and academic stress. Family disruptions, parents being sick, being deployed, getting divorced, all of these type of things also add to this cumulative stress. And we're stressed. As parents, we're all stressed. There's so much stuff going on, so many things that we need to be on top of and to handle. It's stressful being a parent, right? And being a parent and a worker, being a parent and working and being on the PTA, right? All of these hats that we wear add to our stress, which our kids see, and that can add to their stress. Okay, so that's a lot of stress, right? So what can we do to help them? We're gonna come back to this um, list of things. These are all adaptive strategies to help decrease your stress and your children's stress. So we're gonna talk in depth about each of these. First, providing them a healthy foundation. What does this mean? Nutrition, exercise, sleep, I talk a lot about sleep, and screen time, right? Setting their bodies up for success. Talking to them. Talking to our kids helps us de-stress and it also helps them de-stress. Relaxation. We need to provide time for ourselves and our children to, to relax and to play and to have social interaction. We're gonna talk about sensory stimulation tonight. We talk to our kids about they have five senses or there's like 13 if you include all the like micro senses. But we talk about like you know, having these senses, but we don't spend a whole lot of time talking about how we can use sensory information for good, right? So we'll talk about that tonight. Um, Self-awareness, helping our children build self-awareness so that they can identify their triggers, so that they can identify things that make them feel better. This can help de-stress. Nature, we're gonna take a little bit of time talking about the benefits of nature on stress levels, it's quite amazing. And unfortunately, these days, we don't get outside as much as we used to. Um, the weather's changing right now, so hopefully we'll all take this and go, ah, oh, yeah, let's get those kiddos outside, get ourselves out there. And then how do we help our kids build resilience? Resilience, by, by all the research, is the one thing that is predictive of lower stress adults. So we'll talk about how do we do that. Okay, sleep hygiene. Um, some important elements of making sure that your kids are not only getting enough sleep, but getting the right kind of sleep, okay? We wanna set a consistent schedule. And this doesn't mean it has to be like super rigid. If you have hockey practice two nights a week and you're going to bed later those nights, that's okay. As long as you're kind of keeping it consistent week to week, kids know what to expect, their bodies get into a regulated uh, rhythm. Um, start by keeping the, the bedtime routine itself consistent, right? If you're having a tubby at night, you have uh, reading time with your kids at night. They have maybe time where they sit and listen to music or they're doing their potty and they brush the teeth and, and everything. Keep it consistent. Um, take a bath. So oftentimes um, we, we like rush through the nighttime routine and sometimes we're like, oh, I'll just shower in the morning, whatever, right? When you take a bath and you get out of the bath, and this is more so with a bath than a shower, but both, um, your body temperature drops when you get out of the heat. 
right? That drop in body temperature will increase your melatonin production, which makes you sleepier. It allows your body and your mind to just fall asleep much easier. So if you have kids that struggle with falling asleep, make sure those are the kids that are getting their tubby time before they go to bed, right? We want that body temperature drop to facilitate um, that sleepiness. Keeping the bedroom for sleeping in intimacy. Obviously the intimacy is the grown up part, but if you can, try to keep their bedrooms for their quiet time. When they're reading, when they are getting ready for bed, when they just need time to decompress, right? If you have space, keep the toys and the fun activities out of their bedroom. That makes it really easy to know when I'm in this room, if I step away, can you hear me in there? Okay, if I'm in this room, my body, my brain knows I'm getting, I'm, get, I'm like relax mode, right? If I'm in this room, woohoo, fun time, right? So it's, it's this like kind of natural way of knowing when to start, again, that melatonin production, right? Your body knows. Um, caffeine, nicotine, alcohol, and exercise before bed all make it harder to fall asleep, okay? Um, a lot of these are, are, again, more for the adults, but a lot of our kids are having practices, especially as we get into the, the summer months and we have more sunlight. They're having like athletic practices later at night. If you can avoid that, if you can sign up for the earlier one, go for it because it takes longer for our bodies to calm down after exercise. But the trick here is we still want them to get lots of exercise because that helps to facilitate sleep. We just want to try and shift it between the after school time and um, a couple hours before bed. Don't watch the clock. Take the clocks out of the rooms, right? If you're watching your clock, you're not falling asleep. You're going, oh no, I'm not falling asleep, right? And, you, and then you get worried about it and then your thoughts start cycling like, I'm never going to get to sleep, right? We don't want that. Take them out. Your body wants it dark, cool, and quiet in the room. Having a white noise machine, having a little a night light or something, awesome, right? Those things help kids feel more comfortable, helps them fall asleep, but we don't want a bright light, right? We don't want a lot of noise. If you have kids who really benefit from music, have the music playing, but maybe don't have music with lyrics, right? The words can be more stimulating and make it harder to fall asleep. We wanna calm our body and calm our thoughts. And we're gonna talk about some of those later, so I'm not gonna talk about those right now. All right? Okay, get moving. Exercise, movement, playing, running around in circles, doing jumping jacks, cartwheels, whatever. It doesn't matter what they're doing, get them moving. Not only will it help with sleep, it will help get those wiggles out so that when you wanna sit down and have a nice dinner together, right, they've already gotten the wiggles out and maybe you can try to have a conversation with them. Um, I'm not gonna go through the, the benefits of exercise. We've all been inundated with that. All right, Ex um, eating right, nutrition. If we put bad gas in our car, our car doesn't work, right? If we put bad food, a lot of it, in our bodies, it's not going to function optimally, okay? So we want to make sure that we're giving our kids and their brains and their bodies everything they need to, to, to function, right? So if you think in terms of whole foods, natural foods, unprocessed foods, that's the best way you can go. Now, I am not junk food shaming, right? We all need treats and that's totally cool. But if you can make the majority of the food that you're eating good and healthy, then that junk food, the treats, that's gonna be okay, right? It's all about balance. We wanna make sure that we are getting good lean proteins, complex carbs, and fats. Our brains are made of fat, we know that. It's kind of crazy, we don't talk about that. Our kids need fat, right? They always say like, give the, give the kids whole milk, right? And, and like cheese and all these like fatty things, they need that, 
right? So if you're watching, you know, your own intake and are doing the skim milk thing, have the kids get the whole milk, right? Unless your pediatrician is saying something different for your individual child, they need to have those fats. And it doesn't have to be from an animal either, right? We can have avocados and walnuts and all sorts of good things. Um, screens. So in addition to sleep, I talk a lot about screens and what it's doing to our children's brains. Um, just real quickly, what screens do, how it affects our brains. Um, research is showing that it's, it's making a decrease in curiosity, right? If you think just for a second, like how most of us spent our childhood, like, yeah, we had computers back then, but we got home from school and we ran outside, right? We're playing outside with our friends, we're adventuring, we're, we're um, exploring, right? We can pick up something off the ground and it's a sword or it's a phone or it's, it's something, right? Like we're being creative. We're not doing that when we're being shown what we're thinking, right? If you're, if you're watching a show or, or playing a game, like it's providing all of those connections. We're not creating them ourselves. Um, Self-control, right? Everything is so fast-paced that when, when you're constantly on the screens, it's, it's addictive, right? Um, the social media where you get like likes and stuff like that, that is addictive. That is a dopamine dump. Ooh, I got a like. I like that. My brain, do it again, do it again, right? So, so we become addicted to these things, and that causes lower inhibition skills and lower self-control. It makes us more distractible, less emotional stability, right? One of the things that we talked about in the very beginning was this emotional dysregulation. One of the things that, that we know when we see it in our kids, that they're stressed out, right? This is one of the things that, that is caused by too much screen time. Not that that's the only thing that causes it, but it does make it worse. Um, focus, task completion, those things are affected by too much screen time. And then overall, lower psychological well-being. Kim, thanks. Okay, so the next thing on that list, what can we do to lower our stress levels, our kids' stress levels? Talk to them, right? And I know, I'm a parent, sometimes talking to my children is very stressful, right? I'm not taking that away. But sometimes, it can actually help us. We want to be able to listen to our kids. Sometimes all they need is for someone to listen, not to provide an answer, not to say, oh, you should do this, but just to listen. Our kids, and often ourselves, we feel like, like I just want somebody to understand my experience, right? I just want you to get it. Nobody understands me, right? So listen, that's the first step. Talk to them and about what's stressing them out. You know, help them troubleshoot. Like, well, what do you think it is that's, that's making you feel this way? Helping your kids build emotional awareness. This is, this is a big part when we talk about therapy. Like, what is it? This is a big part of what we do. How many times have you been like, just like, Ugh! But you can't identify what it is you're feeling, right? It's just this feeling. There, there's no words to it. I don't know what it is, right? By building emotional awareness, we can go, oh, I'm frustrated because this thing happened at work and then I got home and my husband didn't have dinner ready, right? Like I can start to identify. That's frustration I'm feeling, right? That's fatigue I'm feeling. That's hunger, I'm feeling, right? Helping our kids build that sort of emotional awareness is so powerful. Positive parenting. This is, <laughs> we could go like hours on positive parenting, but it's the idea of treating your children like basically like the way that you want to be treated and talking to them as people and figuring out what their needs are with them and having them be a, pro be a part of that process. Um, that's very helpful. Um, teaching them about mindset. I know District 41 for a while has been doing like the growth mindset, Carol Dweck, right? Like that's awesome. We, we have a running joke, I have teenagers now, and we have this running joke about like, well, I can't do it yet, 
So my daughter's learning to drive and we're backing down our 350 foot driveway and she like did it. It took her six minutes, but she did it. And I was like, you didn't hit anything. She goes, I didn't hit anything yet, mom. I was like, oh, that's, that's when you know you've been talking about mindset a little too much at home. Um, you have to have a sense of humor, right? Life is hard. Kids are weird. Life is weird. you got to be able to laugh about it and let them know that it's okay to laugh at stuff too, right? We're not laughing at people. We're not, you know, it's, it's not this, like, negative thing. But it's, it's finding the joy in the mundane. It's being like, yeah, like, our bodies do weird things sometimes, and hmm, that's, you know, that's kind of funny, right? Making sure that they know that it's okay to, to be light about things. Um, and then modeling regulation, right? I kind of laugh about this because I caught myself stomping my foot. I was so aggravated at my family, right? And I was like, ugh. And I'm sitting there cracking up. I'm like, okay, I'm the professional, right? I'm the one who can teach y'all like to regulate your emotions and, and how to help with this so, these, so your kids don't do these things. And I'm doing it. I was so frustrated that I literally stomped my foot like a toddler, right? I was not modeling good regulation skills. How we model regulation is we say, we, we don't just like keep it in when we're frustrated, but we say, oh, this is really frustrating. I can't believe the washing machine broke again, right? This is really stressful for mom. Or... Um, if they're having a hard day and you say, hey, sometimes it helps me when I just get a hug. Come here. Let's just, let's just sit on the couch and be quiet and hug, right? You're modeling regulation. You're also doing what we call co-regulating, where, where you're using your body to help your child's body regulate, right? That's the same thing as if I'm sitting across from you going, just breathe with me. And we start breathing at the same time, right? You're co-regulating. These are super important um, skills that you're teaching your kids by modeling them and for you. All right, talking tips. Um, talk to your kids openly and honestly, right? This, this is where you can literally save a kid's life. And if it's not your kid, they might be bringing some of these ideas to their peers when they're stressed out and there is, there is nothing more powerful than being able to talk openly and honestly about whatever's going on in your life, whether it's with your child or your child and another child or your child and a teacher or another trusted adult, right? If we can model for them that it is okay to be open and honest, then we are truly going to save lives. Avoiding topics doesn't make them go away. So even those tough topics that we really want to like stay away from, we have to talk about them, right? And we want to make sure that we're talking about them at appropriate times, right? And that at a, at a developmentally appropriate age, but we can't just avoid stuff because then where do they learn all their information? Not from us, right? We, we want to kind of filter um, some of these tougher subjects so that, so that we can guide them in their knowledge. Um, talking openly and honestly teaches them to embrace curiosity, to normalize differences, and encourage respect between all people. And that's what we're talking about, love and respect, right? We're, we're talking to our children and we're building those important values. Okay, so Relaxation was next on that list, those things that we can do to help our kids. Relaxation is a process by which you intentionally change your internal state. Okay, so what does that mean? Stress causes our body to release cortisol. That is the stress hormone. That does all sorts of nasty stuff to our systems, okay? So when we relax, it, 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 it switches that, right? So we're reducing our heart rate. We're lowering our blood pressure. We slow our rate of breathing. It improves digestion, right? How many people's, like their kids, they have tummy aches when they're stressed out, right? It's, it's all connected, right? Um, the, your blood sugar levels, you, um, 
Blood flow to your muscles is improved. Reduced muscle tension, chronic pain, improving focus and mood, right? It's all coming back. It's all those, those same pieces. Um, your sleep gets better, right? And we know sleep is like magic. It does everything we need. Um, it reduces fatigue, reduces anger and frustration, and it boosts our problem-solving skills, right? So maybe part of our nighttime routine with our kids should be relaxation, right? What better way to end the day than to give our bodies and our brains all of that? What a gift, right? And we can do it with our kids, and so we get the gifts too. Jim? Some relaxation techniques. And we're gonna, um, we're gonna talk about box breathing. We'll do a quick little uh, teaching thing on that so that you can bring that home. Um, but deep breathing counts as a relaxation technique, technique. Box breathing, visualization. Anyone here like happy place, right? That's a visualization. You're literally visualizing in your head a place that makes you safe and calm and happy. That's pretty awesome. Massage. I like to get a massage every once in a while, very relaxing. Mindfulness, progressive muscle relaxation. I think we're talking about this one too. Meditation, Tai Chi, yoga, biofeedback. The therapies, music therapy, art therapy, aromatherapy, hydrotherapy, all of those things are built to help calm our bodies, calm our minds. Okay, so box breathing. This is what the Navy SEALs do when they are like literally in the field in a stressful situation. This, this is like the coolest thing. So box breathing, it's really easy. If you can count to four, you can do it. So you breathe in for four, you hold it for four, you breathe out for four, and you hold it for four. Repeat. That's it. One of the most regulating, calming things that you can do is that simple. Kids are like, no way, right? You, you teach them, they're like, that's not going to do anything. That's, you know, that's dumb, whatever. And then they try it and it's like crazy cool. It works. So if everyone wants to just like take a second, we're going to breathe. We'll just do it for two rounds, but I think we've all had stressful days, right? So let's breathe in for four. Hold it. Hold it. That's it. Pretty easy, right? You do that a couple times with your kids and, and you'll see the difference. You'll see the shoulders coming down, right? That some of that anxiety that you can see in their little bodies or in your own, that you can feel the tension, and you're like, oh, yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, visualization. So this is, this is the happy place, right? Here is where we can start to think about our sensory system. So when I think of a happy place or when I'm working with a kid and we're trying to develop their happy place, start with, think of a place. It could be made up. It could be a place you've been or a place that you think you might want to go sometime, place you've heard of or completely imaginary. But think of a place that you, that, that you feel happy, that you feel safe and comfortable, right? And so sometimes you like, filter through a couple places and you talk about like, well, would this be calm? Would this be, you know, and you kind of find that place and then you go, okay, close your eyes. Imagine you're in that place. What do you see? 360 degrees, right? What do you see in front of you? What's over here? What's over here? What's behind you? Really get descriptive, right? You want as much detail as possible. What does it sound like, right? Are we on a beach? Right? A lot of people like the beach. I don't. There's sand. Ew. But imagine you're at a beach. So I'm, I'm describing the waves and I'm describing the seagulls and I'm talking about exactly what I see all the way around me, what I hear, the temperature of the air. Is there a breeze? Right? What am I feeling on my body? What does it smell like? 
Can I smell the, the salt in the air? Is it that stinky fish smell that beaches smell like a lot? Right? Like get as specific as possible with them. And kids are creative. They're going to come up with all sorts of crazy stuff. It's a really neat exercise. Two things happen. One, while you're doing the exercise, what are they not doing? They're not stressed out, right? They're focused on something. And they're, they're embedding in themselves this idea of safety and comfort and calm, right? So by the time you're done just discussing this place and what it looks and feels and sounds and smells and I feel like I lost one, um, when you're done discussing all of that, ask them, well, how do you feel now? Right? There'll be a huge difference in like their perceived anxiety level before and after. Okay? It can, it can be a super, super powerful technique. When you practice your happy place or your visualization, the more you practice, the easier it is to go there. So I have kids that I've worked with who have horrible, horrible test anxiety. Right? You just say like math test and they're like sweating, right? These kids can walk into the classroom and do this and sit down and be ready to do their test because they've gotten so adept at going into their happy place that their, their physiology just responds immediately, right? All of a sudden, I'm calm. I got this. I can do this, right? There's some cognitive techniques that we work on too, some positive self-talk in there. But that idea of that calm and safe place, crazy powerful. The last one we're going to talk about is progressive muscle relaxation. So for people whose mind moves way too fast to meditate or to like calm their thoughts, this is awesome. This, this is where I start because I have way too many thoughts circling in my head all the time. So we go to the body. If the brain's not going to do it for you, we go to the body. So the idea of progressive muscle relaxation is we go in order, top down, bottom up, doesn't matter, but we're tensing our muscles as tight as we can, and then we're releasing it. And we're going to do that for each of our muscle groups a couple times, right? So you start, you scrunch your face up, and kids love this because you look really funny when you're talking to them about it, right? Ooh, squish your face up like this. And then you're going to let it go, and then you're going to do your neck, Right? And you're taking time doing all of these. these. This should take several minutes. I'm not going to waste your time doing that right now. But really, but, but take your time and think of all those little muscle groups, your shoulders, your neck, your, your elbows and, and your wrists, your fingers, all the way down your body. Right, And after you tense them, you're relaxing. And then you can use some imagery here like, it's like, like something's melting out, like my stress is melting out of my body into my bed, right? It's just dripping out. Um, sometimes that imagery can really help kids. But the, I, the, the act of tensing and relaxing, it's, it's a relaxing experience, right? And you're giving them something to think about, something that is structured and sequential, which helps the brain kind of slow down a bit. So that can be super, super helpful. Any questions on the relaxation techniques? OK, cool. That's my happy place. All right. Um, play, humor, and social interaction. These are other things that help us de-stress. So playing, adults don't play as much as kids do, that's kind of sucky, right? Like, playing is really healthy. We need to have fun. We need to do things. And we need to model that for our kids, that, you know, we don't have this, like, dark, despairing, like, adulthood looming over us where we don't have fun, right? Sit down and play with your kids, you know? Do things with them. Uh, card games, board games, Legos, my personal favorite. Sports, arts and crafts. Um, you can watch comedy. You can listen to it, like the old comedy records, whatever. Um, just be silly. Do things as groups, whether it's with your family or other kids, other families together. Like engage in things. 
This is fun. It builds um, social skills, right? It reduces tension. Um, the paint with Bob Ross thing, this was something that, like, just for funsies, in the middle of COVID, we were like, we need to do something. We're so bored, right? I know everybody had that experience. So we're like, let's watch a Bob Ross and, like, paint along. So we got, like, all the supplies. And it was one of the crazy, fun, like, weird memories that we have from COVID. And, and now we have these horrible paintings all over our house. But it was just this random thing that we decided to do together as a family. And it was super fun. So I recommend it. OK, senses. This is one of my favorite parts because we don't really talk about this a whole lot. Our senses. Um, it's how we interpret the world, right? It's how information comes in, and it, this, this gives us all the information about our experiences. And we don't really think about how can we use that to make things better, right? So think about what are the things that you enjoy? What are things you like to look at, right? Is it scenery? Is it art? Is it pictures of your loved ones? Um, the ASMR videos that people are like super into right now. Like, think about the things that when you see them, you kind of go, hmm, I like that, right? You should fill, fill your life with those things, right? Same things for the kids, you know? Sometimes painting a bedroom can be like a huge thing, right? Because then you walk in, you're like, ooh, I like this color, right? This color makes me feel good. Sound. What are the kind of sounds that make you feel good? Do you like the sound of water, of rain? Do you like to listen to music? Um, silence, right? Sometimes as a parent, my favorite sound is nothing, right? I don't want to hear anything. Um, but that's, that's my, my sensory system, right? Sometimes I want to hear stuff. Sometimes maybe I don't. Touch. What are things that feel good when you touch them? Is it a soft and fluffy blanket? Is it something silky? Do you, do you need like um, to fidget? There's fidgets on the tables. You guys take those home, please. Um, you know, do, do you need to do something with your, with your hands to feel good? Well, that's OK. Do it. Smells, personally, I like freshly baked chocolate chip cookies. I think it's a fantastic smell. But what are, what are those things that, um, that you can do for your kids? Maybe it's having lavender. At bedtime, you know, in a diffuser, that can, it smells good, it's relaxing, that can be part of their, their routine. Um, taste, right? We, we tend to do things that, that we like the taste of regularly, right? Because we eat, we're like, I like that, I'm going to eat it. Um, but think about those things. If you, if your child is struggling, with something and you're trying to find ways to make them feel better. Say they're getting really anxious. They're getting really anxious at school and you can make them up a little sensory kit, right? Maybe it's got some mints in there. Maybe just sucking on a mint can be a thing that helps them relax, right? Maybe there's a cotton ball that's soft and squishy and it reminds them of their lovies at home, right? We can have a little Ziploc bag that has these things in it. It could have a picture of your family on vacation that they could look at, right? This is a little tiny Ziploc bag that incorporates all these things that make your kid feel good. That's kind of awesome, right? Vestibular sense. So swinging, hanging upside down, riding a bicycle, walking on a curb, right? That sense of balance. Like we see kids do that all the time. We're like spinning and then trying to stand up. Those are all sensory input things that feel good or can feel good, not everybody. And then proprioception. So this would be like, like those, the big muscles and like squishing, stuff like that that, um, that feels good. I tell families all the time swimming is one of the best like sensory regulatory activities you can do because the water is literally pushing on your whole body the whole time. Right? So for kids who like that sensory input, who need that, get them in the water. Right? What's easier? You could, you could literally just stand there in the water and you're going you're gonna to have that input. Um, doing push-ups, uh, lifting weights, jumping. 
squeezing tight hugs, those are all things that will fulfill that sort of sensory need. Okay, the next thing on our list was building self-awareness, okay? So, if we can help our kids figure out what do our bodies feel like when we're stressed out, when we're angry, when we're frustrated, right? And what does my body feel like when I feel good, right? And get them to really focus on, you know, are my hands clenched? Do I feel relaxed? Is my tummy hurting, right? Do I have a headache? Are my shoulders up in my ears because I'm so stressed out? Building that awareness can help them do the next big step, which is catching those feelings early so they don't blow up, right? If you watch a child have a tantrum, it's, they don't, it, it, sometimes it feels like they go from like zero to 100, right? But if you really watch, there's this ramp up, right? Things are happening that if we can catch them before, we go, ooh, he's, he's looking a little uh, anxious there. You know, maybe we should step in at this point, give him what he needs, you know, and I'm not saying like a toy or whatever, but a hug, someone to talk to, whatever is their need in the moment. If we intervene at that point, they don't tantrum, right? We get their needs met before we get to the point where we're all going crazy. Um, we help them identify those triggers. Right? It might seem really obvious to us sometimes, like, dude, when you're hungry, you are so mean to your little brother. Right? That might be really obvious to us. We see that pattern. If we don't teach that to them, they might not know that. So we want to help them identify those triggers. And sometimes they're not obvious to us. Sometimes it takes a lot of monitoring them and journaling and trying to figure out, like, what are these triggers? But once we figure them out, talking about them so that we can back off of those. Um, are we thinking positively or negatively? Right? Sometimes just asking ourselves that question can be helpful. Right? I work with a lot of middle school girls and the social like stress and and all of you know it's just it's horrible it's like the worst age ever for for social drama right so a lot of times i'm asking them like hey are you thinking about this in a positive way or a negative way like let's let's just leave it there and think about that right that's that can be really helpful um Building self-awareness often comes down to defining what are your priorities? What are your values? What are your goals for you, for your kids? Um, once, once you figure out like what's important to you, then we can use that as a lens to problem solve, right? If if your kid's having, you know, social drama stuff with, with kids at school and, and, and their value is loyalty. Say that's something that's, that you've, you've talked about and you've, you know, come to find that loyalty is so important to your kid. That, that's, that's the thing that makes them, like, that's, that's the most important value, right? So you look at the social... Uh, situation through a lens of loyalty, right? So these people are fighting, and this this kid's been my friend for years, and they've always been there for me. I really like this other kid, but he's kind of being a jerk to this one, right? If you look through a lens of loyalty, it's a lot easier to problem solve, right? Because you know what's important. You know, on the other hand, if something... Um, can't think of a good one at, uh, off the top of my head for like the other kid, but um, depending on what that thing is that's important is going to make it so much easier to, to find your path. Nature. Go for a walk. Just getting out in nature is so good for us. It's good for our brains. It's good for our bodies. It's good for we're, we're not on the phones or the iPads or the Xbox, right? Like, it's really hard to walk around outside and beyond something. Um, it's good for conversation. 
You know, we can walk around and, and talk to our kids. Sometimes just getting out of the house, getting out of your usual milieu, it just helps. Some of the benefits of nature are, we get vitamin D, right? In our area, we don't get a whole lot of vitamin D throughout the year, um, but <laughs> vitamin D relaxes our blood vessels. It improves blood flow, right? Nature decreases our blood pressure. Natural light helps with our, sl bleh, our sleep schedule. Our circadian rhythm is based on light and dark, and so that helps. Like I said, it causes you to unplug. It helps center your mind, right? It's easier to focus on what you need to focus on when you don't have all this other input from everywhere else, right? When your input is literally like, trees and grass and pretty things. Um, it provides downtime so your brain can recharge. You can't be doing the dishes, making dinner, writing an email, and doing all those other things we try to simultaneously do when we're out walking. You can't. So it ends up reducing our stress hormones, the cortisol, it increases our dopamine, that's our feel good. Um, they found that the bacteria in soil boost serotonin. I thought that was super cool, so I threw it in here. Um, and then physical activity increases our endorphins, right? You hear about people who run. I don't understand that, but there are people who run on purpose. Um, it increases our endorphins, right? You get a runner's high, right? That's, like, that's good stuff. Okay. On to building resilience. How are we doing on time? Okay. Okay, I feel like I'm talking really fast. Um, how do we build resilience? We know from research that building resilience is, again, it's that one factor in all the research that comes back. Like, this is how we manage as, as functional adults. So how do we do that? Okay, there's five pieces that go into building resilience. The first is increasing your positive emotions. Seems pretty basic, right? Like, I want to feel good. I'm gonna, I, I would look rather feel happy than sad. Um, engagement or flow. The idea of flow is when you're doing something, you're engaged in an activity, and it's just right, right? You've got, like, you're, you're doing your thing, and you know what's coming, and you can just, like, not autopilot necessarily, but like like autopilot with a positive sense, right? I can drive home on autopilot and I'm not like, ooh, that was nice, you know? But like, say I'm doing my Legos. That's my big stress reliever. I play with Legos. Um, like, I'm putting the pieces together and I see it growing and it's like, yeah. Like, I'm, I'm, in, my, I'm in my groove, right? I've got this sense of engagement, of flow. Positive relationships. Right? We're trying to build relationships with our kids, with our partners, with the people in our community, whatever. Like relationships, we are social animals. Relationships make us feel good. It builds resilience. Meaning, having a sense of meaning, knowing that what you're doing has an impact somewhere on someone in some way, that's really powerful. Right? If we if 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 our kids are just like, you know, going through life, we're just going through life, and, and we don't feel like we're impacting something, right? There's a little piece missing there. When we know that we've done something that has helped somebody or that's made a difference somewhere, like, man, that feels good, right? So having that sense of meaning really builds resilience. And then a sense of accomplishment, right? I purposefully will write lists of things that, like, maybe I've already gotten a couple of them done and stuff that I need, know I need to do because checking it off gives me a sense of accomplishment. That feels good, right? That's one of the things I teach my kids that, um, the kids I work with, right, especially those who have executive function issues, like, man, make lists and check it off because that's like, yeah, right? There's your dopamine right there. I did it. Yeah. It's done. Feels good, right? So that sense builds resilience. Okay, so these are just things personally 
that I've thought of um, in terms of building resilience, just to give you guys some examples. Um, so increasing positive emotions or things that bring me joy, right? My family, my dog. You guys will see a picture of my dog at the end of this. Snuggles with my kids, chocolate, music, tacos. I love tacos. They bring me joy. Engagement or flow. So um, like we were talking about before, having something that you're like just into and, you, and you're like a part of it. So for me, <laughs> building Legos or doing a puzzle and, and, and watching something kind of like emerge from my work, gardening. I don't know, if I, if I have like, like an area that has no weeds in it, like that feels really good. Like I'm doing my thing. And then there's something that comes out of it. Coloring, there's all this, there's coloring books here. There's research now that shows that coloring is like this, this fantastic um, gateway to mindfulness, right? So we've got coloring books all over the place these days. I love that. That's like adults playing, right? We can color and it can feel good. We can do it with our kids. We can do it at home. We can do it on the train, whatever. Sense of meaning or sense of purpose, right? For me, Helping families feel better gives me a sense of purpose. I love my job. I, am, I feel so fortunate that I'm in a position that I can help other families. Like, that's my sense of purpose. Raising my kids. Like, I'm, I'm creating, like, adults that are going to go out into the world and be, like, good people. That's a sense of purpose, right? That gives me this, this sense of, of meaning. Advocating for equal rights. Right? I'm trying to have an impact on the world, something I believe in. Positive relationships, my husband, my kids, my friends, my patients, the parents that I work with, my own parents. Right? These are relationships that I have built that help to build resilience. A sense of accomplishment, things that I'm proud of. Right? So with your kids, th think about like, what are things, what's something you're good at, right? What's something that you've completed? What's something that you are proud of, right? Those are those, the, that sense of accomplishment that you can foster with your kids to help build resilience. Okay, so we've got some strategies, right? We, we are noticing patterns, our kids acting out, we're like, mm, that's not cool. I'm watching for patterns. I realize what the triggers are, right? So I'm going to teach my kids some of these skills, and we're going to practice it, and we're going to work on it, right? Things are getting better for a while until they're not, right? What if all of this stuff doesn't do enough, right? Then what do we do? Okay, if our kids are still struggling, right, and again, I bring you back to the behavioral, emotional, and functional impact that stress has on us, where do we go to find help, right? There are resources at our schools. District 41 is amazing. District 87 is amazing. We are so lucky to live in a community that we have the resources that we have. You can go to a private practice or outpatient therapy. There's community mental health organizations. If things are dire, if your child is saying that they don't want to be here anymore, you go to the ER, right? That's something that, that we don't really think about. But if you're in that situation, and it is a horrible situation, right? That, that's where you need to take your kid. Intensive outpatient programs. So if you have a child who is really struggling, there are programs out there where your kid might go to a facility for a couple hours a day after school or part day to get the treatment that they need. There's hospitalization and partial, partial hospitalization programs. There's alternative schools. There are therapeutic schools. And then there's residential programs. And this. Some of these are not like my kid is stressed out. This has been a rough week kind of thing. These are, these are much more um, dramatic and intensive options. But I think it's important that as parents we know these things exist. Um, these are all sources from the Glen Ellen Police Department. 
on local resources that we have, and um, we can share the slides at some point, and they're all links. So if you guys are interested um, for the local resources. And there's some more. Okay, so, so we're at the point where we can't help our kids as much as we want to, and we're like, all right, I think little Johnny needs some therapy, right? So what is therapy? Therapy involves a treatment of mental health concerns and behavioral problems through communication, relationship, and skill building, right? A lot of times I hear parents like, well, there's nothing like wrong with my kid. It's just like their, their behavior, like they're doing things that we don't want them doing, right? That is something you work on in therapy. Therapy isn't just... Um, you know, depression and anxiety and, and, and those sorts of things. It is behavioral also. Therapy is problem solving, right? Like there's something going on that is, is problematic in some way or another, and we need to solve this problem. We need to figure out ways to make it better. Um, so how do you go about finding the right therapist? Ask around. The parents in Glen Ellen are awesome, right? You guys know where to go for the right haircut for the kid that can't stop wiggling, right? You know where to go to find the best party supplies for Mandalorian-themed birthday parties. You know who the good therapists are. You know who the good dentists are, right? Talk to each other. That is the best way of finding the right fit for your kid when they need therapy. Because fit is really, really important. You can call up a therapist, any therapist, anywhere, and maybe they're the person that you need for your kid. Maybe not. The relationship is the most important thing in a therapeutic alliance, right? For, for change to happen, the relationship has to be there. You might try out two or three therapists before you go, ooh, that's the one right? That's the good fit for my kid. People don't talk about that, right? Like as therapists, we don't say like, I might not be the great person, greatest person for you, but it might not be, you know? You have to have that good fit. So you ask around and talk to people. Psychology Today, um, you know, that like goofy magazine, they have one of the best online resources. You can plug in your zip code, the gender of the, the kind of therapist you want, the issues that they deal with, the training that they've had. Um, you can enter in like all of these different variables and it will, the insurance, right? Do they take my insurance? All of those things you can pop in and it'll spit out local resources. I use that all the time. If I'm looking for a specific therapist who does a specific technique that I don't do and none of my staff does, I go to psychology today and I find that perfect person, right? Awesome. Do phone interviews with people. Talk to them. Ask them questions. Like, we all went to school, right? We all have the degree. We all have the license. That stuff is not, like, what you want to ask about, right? You, you want to get an idea of how they are as, as a person with your kid, right? What are, what are their beliefs and values around therapy? Um, like I said, shop around. You can have initial meetings with a couple people. If you don't feel like it's right, you don't have to go back. Our feelings as therapists are not going to be hurt because we know the relationship is the most important thing. And if their feelings are hurt, then... You don't want to be with them anyway. <laughs> Another thing that you can do online is read their bios, right? You can get a really good sense of somebody if they've written their own bio by how that's constructed, right? What are they talking about? I have a paragraph to basically sell my services to you. How am I filling that paragraph, right? Am I talking about like where I went to school and my diplomas and all this stuff, right? I don't want to go to that person. I want to go to the person who's like, my passion is helping kids overcome blah, 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 right? Like, if that's what I'm looking for for my kid, that's the person I want to see. So I'm going to read those bios. 
Okay, so what do we do in therapy? Yes, we talk, sometimes. Building rapport and trust is, is the number one element of like how change happens, right? If you don't trust the person that you're talking to, how far are you gonna get with change? Whether it's behavioral change or changing the way you think, right? Or um, being able to understand your emotional state Right? If I don't trust the person, like that's going to be really hard for me to change those kind of things. We do stuff in therapy. We do art. We play music. We role play. We have fun. Kids typically love going to therapy. One, they have a one-on-one -on -one adult with, with like all of their attention, right? They get to pick, are we going to read a story today? Are we going to do an art project today? Am I going to sit here and bitch about my mom and dad all day? Like, wh what they need is what happens, right? And you facilitate and, and create change within that. Um, you learn things, right? There's a huge psychoeducation component to therapy. We teach kids about themselves, about the world, about different things that might help them like grow insight in social situations or within their families. We help them build skills, right? So self-soothing skills, mindfulness, regulation, interpersonal skills, self-advocacy. Like, it's very much skill-based. And sometimes we even give homework, not often. Um, I give more homework to parents, sorry, than I do to kids. Um, but that's, that's how we create change. All right, so I think that is it. That's my dog. <laughs> That's my, my Thor. Does anybody have questions, comments, anything? All right. Well, I hope everybody got something out of tonight. Um, if you have any questions that you don't want to talk about this evening, my email is up there. Please reach out, ask questions, okay? I am here in the community and I'm available for everyone, okay? Yeah. That's an awesome question. So, like from a like legal perspective, right? What happens in therapy stays in therapy. However, right? We want to build trust and relation with the whole family, not just with the child. So we want we typically will talk to the kid and say, "Hey, have you talked to your parents about this? Do you think that you should?" Right? Or say like like if we're doing, um, say we're working on like behavioral regulation, right? I'm gonna have to talk to mom and dad about things to try at home to, to facilitate regulation, right? You're not gonna send a, a six-year-old or a 13-year-old home and they're gonna be like, all right, I'm doing my regulation techniques, I'm all good, right? No, we, we need to get the family involved. Um, there's constant contact between a therapist and a family. Sometimes it's, it's more like, so we're working on some social drama as opposed to, well, Susie so-and-so said that, right? Like we, we might not get into the specifics, but you know what we're working on. Parents will know what the goals are of therapy, right? Parents are helping to set those goals. Sometimes parent goals and kid goals are a little bit different. We work on both, right? Um, but the more communication and the more openness and honesty, the more change that, that you're going to see. So we really try to facilitate that. And obviously, like, if there's a danger to self or other, like, we have to disclose and, you know, and we'll disclose. Good question. Yeah. Um, Is that something that you introduce ahead of time? Like, or when the students, when your students in that situation, like, like, do you come home and say, hey, guess what I learned about tonight? Or do you wait for the moment? Oh, so if you teach them when they're not stressed out and practice it, then when they need it, they'll have it available, right? 
if you're super stressed out and somebody goes, oh, here, try this, like how effective is it going to be in the moment, right? You're like, shut up. I'm dealing with this thing over here, right? So bedtime is a really, really good time to practice some of these techniques. You know, you can take like 30 seconds. You can take two minutes and practice some of these things, you know, and, and then when they need it, you know, as parents, we go, you know, little reminder, like, hey, you look like you're getting pretty stressed out. Why don't you try one of those things that, that we practiced, you know? Um, a really quick, easy mindfulness technique. I didn't talk about it in here, but it's called a 54321. And you say, give me five things you can see, right? So they look around, they say five things. Four things that you can hear three things that you can touch, two things that you can smell. I always say one thing you can taste, and usually it's spit or gum, but that's fine because if the child or you are focusing on the here and now and what is in your immediate environment and what your body is experiencing, what are you not doing? You're not freaking out, right? You're not stressed. You're not thinking about the the horrible stress and drama that occurred today, right? You're thinking about what's going on right here, right now. That will physiologically calm you and cognitively kind of bring you more centered. So I love the 54321 because it's super easy and you can do it anywhere. And if you mess it up, who cares, right? You're, you're literally like, maybe it was four things I saw and it doesn't matter, right? The idea is you're being mindful in, in the here and now. Right, no, I know, I get, I get that all the time. So part of it depends on the age of your child. And, you know, I mean, today in schools, like kids are doing school on iPads and Chromebooks, you know, so they're already getting so much screen time from their job, right, from their, their learning. Um, I like to use screen time as an incentive so that they can earn it as opposed to like, you know, your home, you have full access all the time. The more kind of structure and parameters that you put on the screens, the easier it is to kind of have a little bit of control. So um, like no phones at the dinner table, right? Or no iPads or whatever, um, you know, no, Screens in the bedroom, you know, overnight, no screens. I like to have a, a family charging station where everything goes, right? Everything goes overnight, parents' phones, iPads, watches, like all of that stuff. Because if it's not in the bedroom, it's not a distraction. And even if all my friends are, are on, you know, social media right now, like, you can't be if it's not in your room, you know? So um, having structure around the screens, I think, is really important. As far as, like, how much time, it's, it's, it's hard to answer because you want your kids to be doing other things than screens, right? I want my kid to be doing something creative. I want my kid to be exploring something. I want them to do their homework, <laughs> right? I want them to practice their instrument or, you know, hang out with their friends. I want them to build these social skills that since COVID have been really hard to build, right? We're all a little bit delayed in our social development these days. So if they're doing all the other stuff and then they have time, dude, go on the Xbox. Have fun with it, right? If you did your chores, you you know you get your free time. So I, I think that um, in general, the younger the kid, the less time they should have their screens. I don't count school-based screen time in like a behavioral plan for screens because they don't have control over that. Um, I'm a huge proponent of book learning, so. I'd, I'd like to not see them be on the screens all the time. Sorry, school people. Um, 
but you know, if, if you have an older kid that's on for an hour or two a day, I wouldn't let it go over that, you know. Um, younger kids, less. You know, weekends, let them have a little bit more, you know. I wouldn't want my kids sitting on a screen all day when they could be, again, outside or with friends or being creative or practicing something that they love. You know, there's, there's so many other things to be doing. Sorry, I can't give you a time. <laughs> 35 minutes. <laughs> So we received a question from online on the mm -hmm. form. Um, how can you tell if your child just needs some encouragement to boost confidence and motivation before an event due to normal nerves? That is like example, giving a nudge or boost to face new experiences and failures that will ultimately build more confidence. Okay, can you, sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. How can you tell if your child just needs some encouragement to boost confidence and motivation before an event that could be due to normal nerves or truly suffering from anxiety or stress to allow her or him to not to participate in the event. So, so how do we build the, their confidence? Is that yes. kind of the like bottom line? Okay. Um, we see our kids in, in these beautiful ways. Right? We see all the good things about them. We also see the other stuff too, right? But we see all their positive qualities. We tend to not see our own positive qualities. So the first step is, is letting them see what you see, right? You are an amazing little kid. You are so good with your baby brother. I love the way that you helped out your friend. Your teacher really is proud of how hard you're working in reading, right? All of, all of those things that, that we kind of just notice about our kids need to be explicitly told to them. Right? And over and over again, right? You can't, uh, you can't say how amazing you are enough, you know? Um, when, when you're praising your kids, you do want to make sure that you're focusing on, um, like, the process or what they're doing and not the outcome, right? So if you, if you came home with an A on your history test, right, you're not going to applaud the A, you're going to applaud the hard work they put into studying for it, right? You want them to know, because, because what if they work really, really hard and they come home with a C, right? We, the, if they worked as hard as they could and they got that C, we're still going to be as excited because they put in so much effort, right? So, so we're, we're praising their efforts and things. We're praising the growth that we see, not the final outcome. Does that make sense? Basically it's, more about how to... Basically, it's more about like how to get the child not to suffer from anxiety and stress to participate in any event. How to talk to the child, basically, not to feel any stress. If they're getting into a game, if they're not winning in that game, how to cope up with that? So that's, that's where these um, relaxation strategies are really important because if we know they're going to be experiencing stress before something, then, then we want to make sure that we're practicing those things ahead of time and really helping them to, you know, get into, like, the, the mental place that they need to be in order to perform, right? Mm-hmm. Um, 
I know people perceive us as pushing really hard academically, and, and that is important. That's what we do. But first and foremost, we want your kids to be well. So if you're having that night at home where, you know, one more thing is just going to cause the night to go haywire, you pick up the phone, you send an email, you send a note to the teacher and just say, not tonight. We couldn't do it. Um, if that happens every night, you know, we might set up a conference. But we want your kids to be well. Um, on top of and in addition to working with Dr. Larson, who's, who's part of our approach to mental wellness in the district, we have amazing um, mental health clinicians internally, our social workers, our psychologists um, are fabulous. We exist in a community that has a wealth of resources and we know how to access them. Um, and next year we are fortunately, um, we were the recipients of a $250,000 federal grant where we will be increasing our mental health access outside of school because the more that we can keep kids, um, not pull them out of learning because pulling them away from learning sometimes is necessary, but it also causes its own problem of catching up and what did you miss. So um, once we have a, de a date for when we can anticipate those funds, we will be actually working with NAMI and community partners to um, expand what we do for kids and families outside of the day um, and, and just continue to do it. Um, but we exist in a fabulous community, but know that first and foremost, um, we want your kids to be well and we want them to be happy and we want them to achieve at very high levels, but you can't do that if you're not happy and well and excited about coming to school and learning. So you can tell anybody that I said, if it's just that breaking point and you can't do your homework tonight, it is okay. Um, you know, just keep the teachers in the loop and reach out for help um, and go from there. But thank you for joining us and we hope to do many more of these events um, next year using part of those funds to just do parent education um, to the greatest extent that we can and, and we'll be tapping into um, Dr. Larson as we do that. So any questions though for the district that we can send you away on to a, a long enjoyable weekend, hopefully. Okay. Thank you again, Dr. Larson. Um, please don't go down to the table. Bring, bring uh, the tables home to your left seat. We'll get you in the bathroom. <laughs> Thank you so much.